A Legend, all aboard the Nope Sparrow podcast. Today, we are interviewing another spearfishing legend from around the planet. Today, it's Robert Schmaus. Robert Schmaus. It's a very German sounding name, isn't it? You can't, I, can't, I have to make that, that intonation when I say it. But welcome to the podcast. It's interviews with absolute legends from around the planet. Today, it's, it's a Panamanian spearfishing guide. He, he lives there. He absolutely loves it. He's been all over the world and spearfished many, many, many countries. Uh, very experienced guy, more than 30 years, as you'll hear. And today we get a real cool look into Panama as a destination for spearing. I think if you're a DIY type person, you're still going to get a heck of a lot out of this. If you are looking for a guide in the area, then hang on to your hats because we uh, have a Zoom call coming up, uh, as you'll find out during the interview. And we are going to do a live Zoom presentation. Robert's going to show us all about uh, some of the, the offerings that he has there. There's the different types of spearfishing trips and expeditions that um, that he's able to facilitate over there. So I hope you enjoy today's interview. It's definitely something a little bit different for us, um, which is it's really looking at Destination Panama. Uh, I, I had no idea what it was like. So I was absolutely intrigued. I'm absolutely intrigued at the idea of going there and getting, into, getting amongst it. Also, I am going over to compete in the WA Nationals, as I've been talking about in the last few episodes. And I've arrived on some of these spearfishing trips of a lifetime before, and I have been incredibly underdone physically. And there's nothing worse than jumping in the water and diving at half of your best. You know, you really want to make the most of it. You're spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy to go and do these things. It's time away from your family. For me, I, I want to make the most of it. So we're, we're starting a 50-day program. It's called Spear Ready. And at the moment, we're going to launch it on the 1st of March. It's the first of its kind, combining... Uh, strength and conditioning, dry and pull training, a little bit of nutrition advice, as well as actionable tips to help you prepare for that spearfishing trip of a lifetime. I've got a host of legends that are making short videos, short action-oriented videos to help us prepare as best we can. The program is divided into good, better, best. Obviously, um, not, not every week you're going to be able to do everything in the program if you want to go for best. But at least if you do good, it's going to be 80% better than not doing anything at all. So I'd encourage you to sign up, noobspero.com forward slash spear ready. Get amongst it. Have a go. Um, we're really looking for feedback at this stage. So, But yeah, noobspero.com forward slash spear ready. Without further ado, Fish, that's one of Turbo's old ones. Let's get into it with Robert Schmaus. In a world of cancel culture, we need to be bold and stand up. Ignore the self-censorship, have a laugh and poke the bear or in this case a shark, with Fuck the Tax Man. Listeners get a free hat of their choice when they spend over $100 at anoobsparrow.com forward slash taxman when they use the code at Noobsparrow with designs that capture the frustration of having your fish taxed. You'll love the FTTM long sleeve UV blocking fishing jerseys, t-shirts, hats and more. Visit noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman. Use the code Noobsparrow to score a free hat of your choice when you spend $100 or more. Again, go to noobspur.com forward slash taxman. Danny says, Adreno, you guys are ahead of the game. Price is very competitive. Customer service is fantastic. Speed of delivery from your warehouse is the best I've ever experienced. And everything I have purchased was in stock. Great experience. Highly recommend these guys for anything to do with what happens and what you need to get under the water. That review from Danny. Check him out at adreno.com.au. These guys do a fantastic job outfitting Noob Spiros from all over, particularly Australia. But check them out at adreno.com.au. You can save $20 on every purchase over $200. Not only can you use it online, but you can also use it in store. They've got two stores in Brisbane. They've got Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth. Check them out. They are doing good things. Adreno.com.au. Are you US-based looking for free diving, spearfishing gear, Neptonics is the best. Their online website, so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends. And uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10 on your next order, save 10% at Neptonics.com. G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. I'm joined by Robert Shamaus. 
He is uh, an avid Spiro. Been doing it since 1995. Um, currently and living and residing in Panama. Absolutely froths on some of the amazing spearfishing they have around there. Today we're going to geek out a bit on Panama spearfishing and hear a bit about Robert's story. Robert, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure, mate. Um, you, you've you come on our radar f- for a few reasons. You've got a, a pretty cool Instagram channel, Deep Blue Spirit 2, but you've also got a YouTube channel. I think the thing that really come across our radar, though, was you've released two books up on Amazon. Uh, and, you know, Noob Spirit's got a couple of books, so we always notice when there's other cool spearfishing books popping up. You've written uh, a guidebook series. Uh, so there's a two-book Kindle book series, and hopefully they're going to be out print on demand soon. How, how long did it take you to write them and... Was that a combination of all your experience? Yes, that's a good question and a long answer, but I will make it very short. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was actually, I, it started just collecting information when I was a very novice sparrow. So I didn't know a lot of things. And uh, I started spare fishing many, many years ago. At that time, there was no internet. But when there were, was internet and I could collect information, I started to copy paste all this information into a PowerPoint. Why? Because I'm a lady, and in PowerPoint, you can move pictures around, put the text, and in Word, it's a mess. So I use PowerPoint for that uh, purpose, and I collected information starting in 95. Wow. Um, and then one friend told me, seeing this, because he asked me some questions, and I told him, look, this is what I found on the internet, and I helped him out with some questions. And he told me, hey, that's cool. Why you don't publish this? And actually, my friends are the culprits <laughs> of ah. me publishing anything, because I am a very... Not shy guy, but I'm not so much in media and showcase myself, you know. In my Instagram, you see mostly pictures of of fish or some stuff like that. And if you see me, I put even a lens over me, you know, that are virtual and fake ones, glasses. Yeah, Yeah, that's how I started. You and I have jumped on a Zoom call and caught up a little bit before, Rob. But one thing, you know, like your Instagram profile says, share times with good people, discover cool places, inhale nature and smile a lot. From my from my sort of I, I guess about an hour I've spent with you, like that definitely comes through loud and clear. Has that philosophy always been with you? Or is that something that's developed over time, or is that just your nature? That's and it's not even my nature. I would say it's my family. Okay. My mother, she's uh, she was from Germany. She died some years ago, unfortunately, and uh, she suffered World War Two. And then she married my father. My father was born in Peru. He emigrated back to Peru, took her. So we always said she's the export product of Germany. <laughs> and he raised us like very humble people. My father had good jobs. We were not mm. poor, but we were very humble and always checking what people like and not to be surrounded by people that come to you because of what you have and things like this. So it's yeah. actually from my mother's side and my father's side. So I like to enjoy places. Uh, even in business, I never told this my bosses, of course, but when I, we did uh, business with some people or added some representative to our sales networks, I would add them that I think they are reliable, good people, really mean what they say, mm. and you know, you want to talk, uh, things like that. It's quite simple, yeah. yes. That's cool. That's a That sounds like a very interesting combination as well. you got the South American, Peruvian vibes, and then, you know, the Germans have got a reputation for being very hardworking, autonomous, detail-oriented, also very clever as well. So We are that's a, always in time. They're always what? We are always in time. <laughs> oh, always on time as well, yeah, 100%. We do things and then we don't think, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> we start our work, yeah. So you started spearfishing in 1995. Um, how old are you, For just for the listeners? I'm now 56. 56. So nearly yeah. 30 years spearfishing as well. More, but I always say 95 because that's when I went to Spain. Uh, I make it very short. My parents moved to Spain, mm. and when I had the chance to visit them, and I was uh, swimming around, you know, trying to poke some octopus. That's what I call it, perfect for 95. Yeah. So I got some cuttlefish, fish, some but it's easy to catch octopus, uh, some silly fish, flounders, for example. That's easy without a spare gun. Yeah. I didn't know it's a pole spare, so I did things like this. And uh, only Pulpo. 90... Pulpo, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Pulpo, delicioso. Mm, and mm. 95, I was in Spain, I, and I see this guy that is like making a duck dive and disappearing, and I was like, what the heck, you can do this? I had no idea. Wow. <laughs> I went to him. His name, if I remind, is Raul, if I remember. 
And I asked him, what the heck, how do you do that? And he explained to me, he saw that I am a total cowboy. I have no idea about <laughs> it. I just do crazy things and not safety, checking the safety, nothing like that, you know. So he was very kind to me, very patient. And he told me, I'm here the next three, four days. If you like, you can come with me. So oh, he showed wow. me things. Ah, oh, that's cool. That's really why I say 95, because before I was a savage. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and only 95, because I could say I, I was doing this since I was born in Peru with surfing and on the beach. That would be a lie. That's like just speaking octopuses. But in 95, these people, and actually the Mediterranean spear fishermen, are great guys because it's very good with very little fish. I don't mean in size, but like in masses. Yeah. It's very difficult, very loose fish. So you need to dive good and deep. Mm. And it means they have techniques that are not enough to do with like a little bit of this. No, it's far more than this. The right duck dive, the descent, uh, put your chin properly. You know, I will not tell you all the things. You do this by yourself. Mm. But I learned this. And that's why I say 95 was my start. Yes. So it's interesting that you cataloged your journey and like that, that provides the foundation for these books that you've written. That, that that seems to me that you're a very intentional person. Like you are aware of what you're learning and how you're learning it and how you're overcoming things. Is that sort of how the book started? You were like studying specific techniques, overcoming particular issues. Is that is that how it sort of worked? Explain that for me. Oh, you're good. Yeah, that's, that's actually one point. Um, I like, if I do something, I do it right or not. My mother said I'm a lazy guy sometimes when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I'm not lazy. It's like I do a thing and I do it properly or I don't do it at all. Yeah, And that's what's called lazy. But for me, it's like in spearfishing, it meant like I understand one topic. For example, typical first things that people want to talk about is the spare gun, which is funny because other things are more important, but that's how everybody starts. And then discuss hours and months and days and years about the rubber and the strength and the power of the gun and things like this. Mm. And for me, it was like I got some information from one guy, but then another one from another guy. So I was like, oh, who I am to consider which one is right? I don't know. Mm. I'm the novice. And then I started to check, collect, check, collect, check, collect, and this grow over time. And it's yeah. a massive series. The book one, actually, it's more like I sometimes say it's a purchasing guide. That's a fun thing. Yeah. Because it's through all equipment and how to use it. And if you read this, you get a good feeling. Do I really need expensive carbon fiber fins? Yeah. One guy today asked me this, and I asked him how deep you dive, and you know, a couple of questions to get to know him. Mm. And I told him, well, if you have a good budget, you can go for them because they are super nice on surface swimming. You know, they're very forgiving and things like that. And you know what carbon does for a free diver. Uh, but if you have a budget problem, no, go for normal snorkeling fins if you like, because we will roam around this place and this place. And here in Panama, it's a lot of shallow diving. Mm. If we don't move too much on surface and do not do any super athletic thing, mm. then if you're on a tight budget and there are other things more important in life, you know, he's got a family with a lot of kids, then why to bother on carbon fins? Yeah. Then better than normal fins. And I teach you how to move underwater, how to read species, how to read the bait fish, how they behave, you know, when they're together and on, on the ground, there must be predators who stay around that place. Mm. Of things. So, book one is more about gear and how to use it properly, as I said. Yeah. And book two is like, if you like to call it a level two thing, it calls, talks about what, where you find fish, like places, like wave breakers, oil rigs, uh, some cliffs and drop offs and things like this, typical mm. places where you find fish, where is the pressure point where usually fish accumulate because nutrients arrive first, la la la. And then it talks about where to find these places. So we use some tools, can be the most simple, silly one, Google Maps, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. start. Or you take the free version of Navionics, where it works super fine on PC events. So you see it nice and big, take screenshots, make notes, mm. and uh, down to spare fishing techniques, how to spare fish, ambush, and all these kinds of things, Aspetto and Agachon and all these names, wow. etc. I'm going to link up your books today. If people want to search, they are just up on Amazon. But if you come to today's show notes, noobspero.com forward slash Robert for all of the stuff I chat about with Robert. There's going to be a second link as well because we're actually going to do a Zoom call 
with any of you guys that are interested in doing a spearfishing Panama trip. And that will be noobspero.com forward slash Panama. We are going to geek out hard on Panama very shortly. Um, if you are searching just Amazon, the spearfishing guide uh, guide series. There's book one and book two. Robert Schmaus obviously is the author. Uh, but if you go to noobspero.com forward slash Robert, I'll have them linked up there. That, they sound awesome, Robert. That sounds like a really good sort of foundational guide to just getting started. Like you, you do need to know the gear. You do need to know how to find fish. You do need to know how to hunt and start to use all the stuff and put it all together. I was going to, the, the next question I was going to ask is when you do a Zoom call, right? Or when you're talking to any sort of prospective customer or a person that's just starting spearfishing, how hard do you find it to get them to listen to your advice and your perspective? Because sometimes it can be a little bit tricky. Some people have a very fixed mindset. And even though they're new to something, they might think that they know more than they already do. Can you speak to that for a sec if you can? <laughs> I love the question. <laughs> you know, there is a funny thing. Uh, people that are doing this fishing activity for a long time, how I phrase it like this, <laughs> uh, they think they know how fishing works and they are very resistant to new input. That's why on one page of my book, I put a sentence like, be humble, accept criticism, because the people around you fishing. Don't want to teach you like a little kid. No, they're sharing advice with you. And some advices might save your life one day. You don't know. I don't want to be tragic, but can be. Mm. Yeah, yeah. This older guys, we just mentioned one before, um, they're very resistant to advice. And uh, I just let them talk. And then I share what I do, speaking about myself. So I don't confront them, really. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's all I can do, you know. Because many years of spearfishing does not mean you do it on a good level. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the best example, probably. Because I started alone, and I just revealed before, I was a savage. I was a cowboy. <laughs> Everybody was like, yes, no, and I was not more 15 years old. I was older when I started in 95. So they were shaking heads and not believing what I told them and what I did, especially. And I was open-minded just to absorb all I could to learn. Mm. And some people accept after a while. So people, for example, in the places I lived, uh, when they are resistant to information, that's okay. They don't need to listen to me. I'm nobody to push them to listen to me. But when they are on the boat with me, they see details. No, I tell them, hey, this not look what I'm doing. Maybe it's easier for you to open. Or when you unload the gun, a roller gun, don't snap it. You kill the wishbone, use your loading assist to click inside, and then you release it softly. I don't know, just examples, things like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I love it when people take time to teach me anything. But in spearfishing, sometimes I feel like the longer you do it, the less people want to tell you anything because they feel like I may be talking down to you. But for me, like one of the founding values of Noob Spiro is no ego. And having a mindset that always says that you're learning and you're always open to learning new stuff. Sometimes someone might tell me something and I disagree with it. But I'm like, and that's okay. We can just have a conversation about it. I, I don't understand why some people are so precious about being so rigid in what they think that they know. And that's sort of like that glass, glass full, you know, that you can't put any more in. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but the majority we, of sparrows. Sorry, the majority of sparrows are very open-minded, I would say. I agree. And, and we're talking about the Zoom calls. The Zoom calls add a, a, a component that I cannot do when I just speak with somebody verbally, is that I show a lot of images. Mm. So I explain Panama, I explain the currents, the wind situation, I explain the islands, I explain the topography using avionics maps also to explain things. And this is so graphically that there is no discussion because it's not me talking. It's like I'm just yeah. moderating these yeah. images and are not my images. So this is like facts, it's scientific things, you know. So that's an easy way to go around probably. Just show them both, very structured. And then for them, it's like, ah, good. Ah, information is valid. Yeah, it's official. <laughs> One thing I like about your presentation, and I think a lot of people overlook this, is that you, you really show people the beauty, the power, and the the sheer awesomeness of Panama as a spearfishing destination. Like you, you don't actually spend a lot of time 
selling yourself. You know, you, that just comes through in the call with your knowledge and the way that you walk people through it. But you really present Panama in, a, in an amazing light. I want to go there now after watching your presentation. So we'll, we'll get but to... It, sorry, yeah. but it's it because the place is really cool. Yeah. So one of the questions people ask me, how did you find out the best location for spare fishing? Well, actually, it's where I'm living now because I had to take a decision. What's next? Like, which country I would live? And probably until I die. And I made a lot of research with my wife because she can also have an opinion, of course. <laughs> I'm yeah. not alone. And we had some destinations in mind. And one of these is Panama. And one of the very big checkboxes, because I have this passion, yeah, is there should be some nice fish here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I talk to um, older Spiro guys that are way smarter than I am all the time. Like, uh, I love chatting to people like you that have kind of intentionally designed a life to do what they love, you know. And it, it seems like you're one of those guys. I, I take my hat off to you. I, I'm still in the trenches over here in Australia, working flat out, running Noob Spiro, and uh, trying to make it all work, Robert. So well done, buddy. Um, Let's get into a little bit more of your story if you can. So one thing that stuck out to me was um, you went and got certified as a spearfishing instructor at the International Spearfishing Academy in uh, the UAE. Can you just tell me a bit about that experience and why you went and did it for a start? Yeah, that's a nice step in my life in spearfishing because so far I was teaching and helping a lot of people without any credentials or license. Uh, and then I thought, a friend actually told me, why you don't become a spearfishing instructor? And then again, my friends told me what to do in life. <laughs> and I listened to some of them. And then it came the time just before pandemic. And I talked to a friend of mine that is instructor for instructors in the UAE. His name is Sarir. And he's a very nice guy. And I, he told me, I can do the course for you because I'm allowed to do this by my license. So he's higher ranked than myself. And I did the license, and the idea behind this was because I knew I will come to Panama. Yeah, I did not know when exactly because my plan is not made in you know, stone. Yeah, yeah. Stone. But I knew that would be probably beneficial to give people some. You know, they need to become get something after the course. Mm. And if it's only over talking, they get a handshake, a very warm hug, and that's it. But yeah. most of them. They probably like to have some carnet saying, hey, they did level one, level two, things like this, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it gives, as you said, yes, it gives also more credibility to what I do. Because mm. who is Robert? Nobody knows me. And I'm not very famous on the internet because I'm doing very little on the internet or on social media. Mm. So I think that's a way people feel also more safe mm. when they talk to me. When they go to a course, okay, this guy knows this. Mm. Now I have these books. This It's funny. It gives also a push again. I call yeah. it pedigree. So some pedigree, you know, yeah, it helps, yes. It, it does, and it's just the nature of things. Like if people don't personally know you, then, you know, you need to, you know, show people that you're credible and you you have a level of expertise and authority. And that's why we have licenses and qualifications and things in all different fields. So I 100% get it. You know, when I did my um, freediving instructors, I went with Paddy because Paddy's so easily recognizable. Um, the requirements for the freediving course are also, I, I quite I quite like it. But um, yeah, the recognition you get, people, you know, like you, as soon as you say, I'm an instructor, you know, some people think that that means something amazing. Um, I, I would really like to hear about what that experience is like doing your instructors there. What's involved in it? What are the kind of the requirements? And maybe if you have a cost estimate, like if other people are interested in doing it. You mean cost estimate for the instructor license? Yeah, to go there and, you know, is, is there accommodation provided? I mean, how do you sort of, what's the workaround? I will start like this. I chose them because there is a lot of SSI, FII, PADI, a lot of other organizations. And I chose them for the simple fact that I know these guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I was working in Dubai, so I knew Sarir from always. Yeah, he's a great guy. And I know the other guys that did also instructor licenses with ISA, with the International Spearfishing Academy. And um, the person that founded ISA is Dr. Jamal. And he's a very nice gentleman, well situated. So it's not his business, let's call it like this. Yeah. yeah? And I, with a lot of respect because I love these guys. He does this for pure fun and passion. Wow. Yeah. It's not his main income at all. 
not at all. So when I saw this, and he was also um, teaming up with uh, Ryan Myers, mm. okay, from, from now Hawaii, US team, and with three boats from South Africa, they are in their team. So one is like chief technical officer, the other one is responsible for US operations and environment. So we met both of them in Dubai, and I liked how they talked and what they were focusing on. So it was like a mix of, of course, spear fishing. That's what the course is about. But no sparrow can do it well without understanding free diving. So we talk about the, body, the human body, breathing technique, safety, hazards, a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. And then also ecology. So don't shoot fish you don't know, you know. Don't shoot sharks and put them on Instagram because you think you just chased a lion in Africa and you hunted him down. This is silly. So I liked a lot their ethics. And as I said, not to repeat myself too long, they do this for passion and you can feel this. And the content of the course, it's nice. I love it. It's very very concise, very nice. Mm. And the cost, you asked me the cost, I don't remember. Do you you remember any of the requirements as well? Like was there like performance requirements and things like this? Yes, you need to be at a certain level, of course. So you have to complete the level one, level two typical things. Okay. Uh, dive down to 30 meter breath hold of, I don't know, two and a half minutes or three minutes. Uh, horizontal dynamic, I don't remember how long, but you need to be at a good level. Mm. Yeah, my plus was that I did this already years, years ago. Yeah. So it was very funny because in an interview, they asked me things and I did not study too much, to be honest. I knew all these things because I wrote the books, collected information. So I was like a store having information in my head. And it just <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. cool. That's cool. That's cool. All right. So you, you've broadly traveled as well, Robert. Um, you've lived in a lot of countries and you've also been spearfishing in a lot of countries. I, I can't remember exactly how many. Can you remember off the top of your head? Uh, no, neither. <laughs> <laughs> but many. 20, 20 wow. maybe. Wow. Yes. wow. I traveled a lot, but you know, it's not like I was traveling for spearfishing. That would be a lie. Yeah. I was traveling because of my job. And then I was thinking like, hey, wait a second. I'm in Bali. Ah, I can stay a week longer and then I have a weekend in between. Then I grab a flight and go to this place and then I can spare fish. And I had contacts there, you know, uh, the people of Tixi, that is a manufacturer from Greece for, for guns. He lives there, the president, Angelos. Mm. So he invited me to the trip. It was super nice and opened a lot the horizon. And through the job I had, I had the chance to travel a lot. Sometimes was myself. But most of the time like that. So I could spend three, four, five, six, seven days on a place. Wow. And I put my vacation between two trips. And my bosses were always nice. They knew I'm doing this. I told them, hey, is it okay? Because it's like looks like fishy. I travel there on, on, on your expenses, but then I go there. But I will pay my ticket, my hotel, everything. And I stay there seven days. He said, oh, I don't care. Do it. It's fine. If I have a, have a customer, uh, sorry, an employee that is happy, he will be more successful and working hard, I say, yes, sir. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I just went. <laughs> oh, nice. What were some of your favorite um, destinations? Or maybe just pick one. That's a very difficult question because every destination is different. And that's why I like it. It's like asking if I like jungle or desert. Mm. Uh, okay, I will say Hawaii, I laughed. Mm. Hawaii. Not because I caught the biggest fish, which was not the case at all. Mm. But there is big fish. It was because I found it very challenging. Mm. And I had to adapt in one or I was there two weeks. I went twice to Kauai, North Shore, Oahu. And these guys, I admire them. Because the currents and the tides and the waves and oof. If you're in summer, it's more chilled because there is not too much waves. But it's very hard diving. Fish is very elusive, and you notice when you do the duck dive, and all fish disappear. It's like, oh, oh, they know what a sparrow is. Yeah. And I was w- with a smaller gun, one rubber. I was underpowered, but I love the destination for the challenge and the view, the fish, the sharks. It's crazy corals and the drop offs. You know, Hawaii is like a peak in the middle of the ocean because they have like seven islands, and. You go a little bit out and it's, it's deep. Wow. I found it nice. Of course, Bali, the Doctor's Tuna, it's nice and big fish. Yes, but 
Personally, I would say Hawaii probably. I watched one of your videos in the United Arab Emirates and for people in sort of down under, if you like, Australia and New Zealand, we wouldn't maybe, not everyone would think of the United Arab Emirates as a potential spearfishing destination, but it looks pretty cool. Like the viz doesn't look amazing most of the time, but you do get quite a, a lot of fish there, it seems. Yes, and you know, the cool thing about UAE Besides, it's nice living there. It's very safe. The, the locals are amazing. Wow, people, they're hot. They're very friendly, guys. Oh, wow. They have two coasts. Mm. So one guy told, asked me one day, are oh, you live on an island? Because I said this coast and this coast. They no, <laughs> it's a peninsula. Yeah. And we have the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf. And then we have the Indian Ocean. I can choose. Yeah. So in the Gulf, the water can be more murky, as you correctly said, Shrek. Um, but there are days that it's very nice and it's more murky closer to the northern part of the Emirates, so Dubai and the other Emirates. Yeah. If you go down to Abu Dhabi, it's not really south, but like in my head it's south, then it gets more clear because there have been less work done on wave breakers and breakers and all these artificial islands. Mm. So the topography is more intact and less silt. Yeah. That can yeah. Uh, we go to, to oil rigs there a lot. Okay. And at the oil rigs, the base was, wow, you think I'm somewhere in, in the Texas Gulf, Bahamas, you know, it's clear water, nice. Wow. And, uh, yeah, main species there are amberjacks that we, we dive on wrecks that are quite deep, but you can make some sounds and these silly fish come up to you. <laughs> I love silly fish. Spanish mackerel, beautiful fish. They grow huge. My son caught one at 22 kg just, and he was there for vacation, and he was always beating my records just by appearing there suddenly. <laughs> uh, golden trevallies, uh, groupers, uh, African pompano, he loved this fish. Yes. I Emirates is a very nice destination. I haven't shot an African pompano. I, I really want to. They look, they look really cool. Like, yeah. They're delicious. Yeah, I hear. I hear that as well. Um, yeah, they, they get them in... We get them here occasionally. Um, they seem I don't understand them and how they how they how they operate off Australia or particularly like where I am off Brisbane. Like I don't understand when when they're here and why they're here. I don't understand. I don't think they are here all the time. Very yeah. Well, they're tragic, so they might migrate. I don't know about mm -hmm. Australia, but in the UAE, I found them when the water is cold. Funny enough, when there is a lot of current. Because they are very slim fish, you know. For them, it's easy to advance against currents. Yeah. yeah. And they're very broad, very high broad, but thin. So they do it like this, yeah. and they disappear. They're very fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. They're cool school pelagic. I, I, I really like them, yeah. Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, understand your body better, and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program is not for noobs, as this program is for people who have some diving under their belts and understand some basic spearfishing safety, but it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. The five minute freediver works. Get started for free and see if it's for you at howtofreedive.com. There's a tester there. Use the code NOOBSPEARO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Freediving for spearfishers, a fantastic way to prepare, especially if you've got a big trip coming up. Get to that five-minute mark, and it does translate to your diving at howtofreedive.com. Hey, Nooba, get your froth on with some Noob Spiro gear. The Jobfish Tribute, Spiro Dad, Rancid Pelican, this gear is only available at noobspiro.com. From flip-flops, crocs and socks, through to hats, shirts and stickers, get your froth on with Noob Spiro at noobspiro.com. Handmade spear guns from the USA, killshotspearguns.com, have made rugged, functional, simple spear guns utilizing the best components. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Save $30 on any timber spear gun. Use the code NOOB. Visit killshotspearguns.com. Talking about species, like you've been spearfishing a long time. I, again, it's probably like apples or oranges or bananas, but talk to me about one species that you, you, you really love to hunt 
and maybe it's there in Panama, and um, how you do that effectively? Um, I have different categories in my mind, like difficult fish, sneaky fish, elusive fish, you know, that's what, I, and, and I'm very, maybe not the sparrow who goes out to catch the biggest fish. Yeah. No, not really. Yesterday, for example, I was catching mullet snapper. They are not the biggest one, mm. but I love to eat them or some yellow snapper. So if I think Mediterranean, I would think the dentex. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> they are super smart. And when I shoot with my gun, it's like they would know the brand and the range of the gun and they just stay one meter further. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I do all the dirty tricks I know and they are difficult to fish. Mm. So the only recipe for those, it's really a very long breath hold because they are predators, they are curious. So they will come in, but it takes them a long time. And then they come in, come out, and they return, and they send first their small juvenile fish in front of them to check. Then when they, I see, they see I don't do nothing to the juveniles. That's why I always say never shoot the small ones. You kill all this hunting scenario. Mm. Well, it's very hard, but here it's the same. Here would be, I love fishing snappers, and I use a short gun, 90 centimeter tube, because it's very maneuverable. Yeah. And I love to sneak around rocks. Yesterday I saw a cubera like this, so not huge one, but good for eating. They're actually good for eating as a meat. And I saw him and he saw me and he disappeared very slowly and I followed him without spooking too much, just to see where he goes. And I was just at the beginning of the breath hold, so fine. And he went in under a rock and I thought like, ah. And then I looked into the rock, I had no flashlight and I saw there were like five of them. Wow. So one way to hunt and it's very fun is to find your victim. Yeah. <laughs> follow them, stalk them. They will lead you to the big cave or wherever they hide mm. and resting there. So I took the biggest one, was a little bit bigger than the other one. I waited that he turns a little bit to me to shoot him so I can pull him out easily without getting the shaft stuck and things like this because I was shooting with uh, two reps, wow. which is not ideal for cave hunting, of course. You know, it's too much line giving mm. them liberty to do what they want. So the snappers. And I love more personally reef fishing. Mm. around rocks and stuff like that. I saw I, I saw one of your videos. Like uh, you were hunting, uh, what is it? It was a strange fish. Uh, Pago Amarillo, which is one of these snappers. It's another Lichanus by the looks of it. And I really liked the look of that hunting too. There was a little bit of current pushing over. There was um, some heavy sediment in the water, but it looked like a really cool sort of cave, like crevice hunting area. It looked very, very fishy. When I'm from the top, if this allows, I try to scan, but I study a lot of uh, avionics and things like this and, and photography. Mm. So I see the cliffs, so a lot of rocks must have been falling down by erosion, la, la, la. so there is a lot of habitat for them. And if I see this for pargos, for snappers, I stay at that place because they love these holes and labyrinth thing where they, if some, some hazard arrives, some danger, they go down and there is, there is a connection. It's a labyrinth. Yeah, yeah. They can disappear here and they emerge again 10, 15 meters further and you have no chance. So, yeah, I, I, I like this difficult fish, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it too. It's hard sometimes. When you were cave hunting, like with that hunt, I noticed like you were very intentional. You were heading in a direction and I thought, oh, he's going to go that way. And then you changed, I felt like you changed your mind because you had a, a bit of an intuition that there was something to the right. And then you sat there and you assessed what was going on and picked out your fish and, and it was pretty cool. With You said you used Navionics before. Are you particularly using a premium version now? Are you looking at relief shading? Uh, what do you do these days? No, I just use the standard version because my interest is to understand uh, how I explain this. Okay, to make it simple, mm -hmm. there is habitat A, habitat B, for example, sand to reef rocks yep. or... or, or Normal coral reef. Habitats meet. This is also valid for hunting on land, by the way. On this edge, you will have the highest density of biodiversity. Not maybe biomass, but diverse diversity. So you can find the thing that you're looking for. Yeah. So in this case, what I look on avionics is for big changes in, st in stepness and steepness, sorry. 
Yeah. So the lines get closer, closer for those that don't, don't understand topography means the difference of one meter, if your lines are one meter height, for example, they will be close together means one meter, one meter, one meter, goes steep down. Yeah. And then you see 25, a big patch, then you see 26, a big patch, that is quite even. Yeah. So it can be interesting there as well, but again, it depends what species you look for. Yeah? Yeah, if yeah. I look for emperor, okay, I will stick more to the sand. Mm. But I will also think, okay, where are the nutrients? Because they eat little worms and crustaceans and things like this. Mm. Well, actually, the nutrients will come from this side, will hit something and then whirl around and these small things that are the victims of the emperor will eat it, that. So they, probably the emperor will look for his food there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I study a lot, a lot marine life and, uh, and let's call it the environment I will be hunting in mm. just to try to understand what a fish would like to do and where mm. he would like to stay, to relax, to spawn, to feed, things like that. And how, do, how did you do that? How do, how, do you, how do you start that process of, of like investigation with regards to groups of species? Like you sort of identified there, like emperor species, and we're talking about, what did you call them? Um, like with the Alajana snappers, what do you call them? Pargos. Yes. Yeah, and then you have, you know, you have um, different pelagic behaviors. Like you have surface swimmers, you have midwater swimmers. Spanish mackerel can be on the bottom, can be on the middle, can be, you know, they, they can be, you know, different places at different times of year with different nutrients in the water and stuff. How do you, how do you how do you begin the process of understanding each of these groups and how and when to fish for each type? Okay, that's a super question. It's a and difficult that's one. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a very good one. It's not difficult at all. Um, because let's assume I'm new to this area. Yeah. Mm. My first thing is would go out with some sparrow guys that understand the place. So locals, not friends of mine of Dubai or no, 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 even I love them. Sorry for that. But <laughs> I would prefer the local guys. Yeah, yeah. Because they what they do and I can learn from them and hopefully they have some rules in their mind to explain things where, like what you asked me right? mm. so I would for example I went to Oman which is like south from UAE United Arab Emirates and Oman it's not UAE so I wanted to understand what I do so the first dive I did there which I will explain this it's like I dove down to I don't know 25 meter was waiting for the Spanish max and I did not see one and the other guys were chasing one after another, loading the boats with the mackerels. And I was like, what the heck? How you guys hunted? And they smiled at me and said, okay, now we tell you. You <laughs> go down, make all this deep thing work, and we just stay at five meters and wait for them. Yeah. Say, but how do you know they will be there? Because there is a murky layer and thermocline, all this kind of thing. So it separates areas in depth, right? Mm. So they just stay above it when it's murky. And then there is where the Spanish mackerel cruises that day. Yeah, and there is probably where the the bait fish will stay unless they see a predator, then they go down to the murk again, because they don't like the cold; they prefer the warm. Mm. Yeah, and most of the wind and when there is waves will circulate all this upper layer, mm. so the nutrients are there, so they can be in the warm, cozy water, and then the Spanish mackerel will follow them, and then we find them. So things like that. I ask people. I I I've been thinking about this a little bit lately, like. People talk about like with competitions, they say, you know, it's one third uh, local knowledge, one third skill and one third luck. Um, do you agree with this as a rough heuristic for understanding an area and being successful? I think yes, because, you know, we know all these things and then we go to the same place. We go always and it always works. And that day, for some reason... Moon phase, uh, the tide was good, and all these parameters that can be variable work, and all these guys are not available. Mm. We mm. make jokes and we say they went, they went vacation to Miami, or I don't, they are not there. All these fish are not there. So it's also luck, yes. Yeah. Um, yesterday, for example, I felt I had a lucky day because it's like a flow of things that I did, and I was chasing one fish after the other, and then I stopped because I had enough fish. But some days it's like, I don't see fish, but my buddies do. Mm. Yeah. But I'm checking what they do, and they don't do, apparently, nothing different than what I do. So it's like, that's the luck component. I don't know. Yeah. 
Have you ever, like I've gone out with friends before and for whatever reason, like my body's just not good. Maybe I've been working too much during the week, maybe drinking too many beers. I jump in the water and my, my diving is just terrible, right? I just feel like shit. And then, but I shoot really good fish and, and that, that diving, like doing these, these amazing dives and then I get more fish than them. And then, but the opposite can also be true. Like you go out and you're diving amazing and then some new guy or whatever that hasn't been spearfishing, they shoot the best fish. It's like uh, fishing, like there's a huge component of luck to it. And um, I like that. I like it. Yes. And for me, it's, to be honest, from my friends here, they're really nice people. I'm probably the only one that does not shoot sometimes. Yeah. Because I don't feel like I need to compete nobody. I don't care, you know. I mean, I've shot so many fish in all these years. I'm not 20, you see? That's the difference, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. care. And instead, I'm having the GoPro on my on my head strap here, on my forehead. And, uh, for example, some weeks ago, I saw, I wanted to get some uh, cuberas, and I yeah. saw them already. So I knew they are in this place. Yeah. And then I dove down again, and then I see this huge grouper, this uh, Pacific Goliath grouper. And I love these guys, and I don't mean to shoot them. I like to, as a, as a pet kind of thing, you know. Yeah, they're yeah. And I forgot the barbos, everything, and they were running around me, and I have this on video. And then I just focus on the grouper, and I went very close to him. It looks like I will hunt him, but I'm not hunting him. I'm just filming him. But you see the spare tip of my spare gun? Yeah. And all my friends were like, why did you not shoot the pargo? And I said, well, I was filming the Goliath. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time doing these kind of things, yes. I think one thing I'm hearing is, you know, like people talk about uh, the maturity, you know, the maturity phases of a, of a Spiro, you know, like, and when you kind of get to the end, it becomes more about giving back to others. And then, but you, you, you're, you've taken it a step further because you still have a level of understanding and empathy for everyone at all the different phases of their maturity curve. I, I like that because sometimes people will get to the, you know, the, the end of their evolution as a Spiro or, or the, you know, like they become very selective, right? And, and, and just shooting fish is not really the focus for them anymore. But then they, they can turn around and look at other people that are at, you know, less advanced stages and they are a little bit nasty towards them or, but you seem to still have a fair amount of grace and understanding for people at all different stages. Is that, is that a, is that a fair statement? That's a very fair statement. Yeah. I'll like make that. an example. I had a guy, he's like quite a beginner. He does not do a lot of spare fishing, but that's also one point. I don't expect everybody to be like spare fishing ethics and la 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 and be skilled enough to do this and that, even if spare fishing 20 years. Mm. Why? Well, I do mostly spare fishing. I do, don't do other things like football playing or basketball, volleyball. I don't do these hobbies, yeah, because I love this. But the other guys are in football, they are swimming, maybe they do some crazy hip hop dance courses, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. because of and ballet, I don't know what kind of things. So they have a lot of distractions from spear fishing mm -hmm. and time is limited. So I cannot expect that everybody treats this as I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have kids with me. They're grown. So I'm, yeah, I can do everything I want. Like if I'm a teenager, for me, it's easy. Mm -hmm. And then a new sparrow, for example, last time he was saying, Robert, there is this fish there and blah, blah, blah. And I know is this, how you call it in English? It's a reef fish with big teeth that is like... Munching on corals. A ras, a ras. And a trigger fish. Ah, trigger fish, yep. This fat, big Pacific trigger fish, they get huge. Oh, this fish, and you know, it's not typically a fish we would shoot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's very delicious to eat. Yeah. I shot them as well a couple of times. <laughs> so I told him, yeah, go ahead, shoot it. Because I want him to understand how to catch the fish, how to get close to it, even that's mm. a easy one. But then after it's like how you retrieve because that's where the job starts. Yeah, yeah. Can you handle the fish? This guy will bite your fingers off. It's like a like a plier, you know. So yeah. don't play. <laughs> He's got no gills. So how you will how you will grab him? It's mm. a very different anatomy also. So no, I'm fine. People shooting even some undersized fish. I mean, if it's one. He's starting. He did not know this, of course. Who I am to 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 judge him. But I will tell you, hey, bro, this fish grows like that. Yeah. 
not allow him to have the fun part of life, so he did not reproduce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. Let them grow a little bit more. You know? Ah, it's such a good way. I love the, I, I love what you're doing. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I think I think um, that's a way to teach people. You know, like like um, taking one fish out of the ecosystem is not the end of the world. You know, if, uh, um, but but if that person continues to make the same mistakes, that's a different issue. But I have yeah. a lot of I try to have a lot of understanding for people at that end of it because. That is how you learn. And if you shoot something under size and then someone gently tells you the story of why you don't do that, that'll stay with you forever. And then you will teach other people the same thing. And then we all get better and we all understand the ocean a bit more, which is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to get ethics as we go along. You're not going to start spearfishing with all the ethics. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, but sometimes people will have these expectations that people are going to jump in the water with the same level of ethics that they have after 10 years of doing it. I'm, come on, guys, come on. I will tell you something I should not say, but it's very honest from my side. Yeah. It was in Spain. I just started spearfishing with asparagus, a decent one, not some stick or crazy thing. Mm. And I saw this fish and I had no idea that underwater you see like a third bigger. Yeah. Because of this, you know, you know, this reflection kind of thing. Yeah. So I shot one fish and I was like, wow, cool. And there was like a bunch of them. And I shot more of them, more of them. And then when I was at home, I looked at them. It's like, shit, they are so small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was so ashamed. And yeah. then even feeling them did not make sense. So I put them all into a grinder kind of thing. And I did it feed all the stray cats on the road. They loved <laughs> me that night. <laughs> but I had no idea. And I really felt ashamed. But yeah. you make it. You're like in a hunting rush. And you think, cool, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And it was the wrong thing. So, yeah. It, it's it's funny you say it. Like I think it, it's supposed to be like from a physics point of view, everything seems twenty five percent closer and thirty three percent larger or something like this. But you know, after a while, our brains adapt and they they allow for this, and that distortion is kind of our brain sort of fixes it for us. But recently, I got in the water and the water was filthy. It was like th three meters, ten feet visibility, and I shot a fish that I thought was like ah, it's like one and a half kilo. And then I pull it in, it's like 700 grams. And I'm like, <laughs> for, 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 new, for new people to make that mistake, I'm like, oh, good. But for me no, to make, yeah, but for me to make that mistake, like I'm a much more, I, I shouldn't, I, I always hold myself to a much higher standard. And, and, I, and we should, you know, like, um, yeah. But I think this but is. Difficult sometimes because, for example, if you're in open water, like offshore or blue water, you have no objects to compare this incoming object to. So mm. how your brain adapts, and it's correct what you say. Here I have nothing to compare. Mm. Yeah, on my reefs here where I know, where I know there is the rock, this is two meter, five meter, I have something. Yeah, it's not perfect, but something. Mm. But when there is Babu is swimming in, is it 1.5 meter or only one? Or is it a big one? And he's very close. So what I try to do, it's not the magic recipe. It's like if I see him close and I can denote details on his face and I can see his eyes, like like you see, the, 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 how to explain it? I see him very sharp. Yeah, yeah. But, and he should be close. Then I will pull the trigger. Yeah, yeah. But not easy. Mahi, the same. All what is offshore, it's not always easy. Eh? I've heard the same thing. Like get get so close that you see all the details, and that's how you know you're close enough. But it's blue water is very deceptive. I hear exactly what you're saying. I, I, when I jumped in the water and I shot this fish, I wasn't thinking about how low visibility can also distort your perception because they're much closer than than you realize, and so they're they're not really at the range you would maybe normally shoot them at either. You know, like you're seeing this fish at two meters. Normally, you would see it at you know four or five meters away. So they seem much larger sometimes. It was just, yeah, I was not real happy with myself. But we we make these mistakes. Um, Robert, you've been spearfishing a long time and, you know, nowadays maybe shooting big fish, like you said, is not the most important thing to you. But in your lifetime, does some fish stand out to you? Is there a, any particular fish? I would not say by kg. You mean by, by, by experience? By no, experience. What, what was maybe one of the most memorable fish you have, um, taken and I would love to hear the story. Hmm. 
The Mediterranean probably because it's so difficult. Mm. So the dentex, uh, I remember one, Adorat, that it's a gilt head cream, I think it's in English. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And this one was very elusive. I mean, they're a little bit difficult sometimes and depending on the show on the day, but that was very elusive. And I saw her, she went away. I saw her, she went away. So I went like three, four times down. And then I thought, I will catch her now. I will go under this hole. I can hide my full body because before she could see a tip of my fin, things like this. And she was not big, maybe like that. No idea how much this is, one kilo, one and a half. Yeah, yeah. And I saw her and I leave the GoPro LED on always. Everybody tells me, shut down this thing. It, the fish will see it. Say, yeah, that's what I like. It makes ah. blue. Huh? Mm. And a lot of times they came, the snappers here, they go crazy with this light. It's like it's disco fever or something. So <laughs> she was coming closer. And then I felt, okay, probably that's the range. She will come, then she will turn. And then I ducked down and I disappeared. Mm. She did not see nothing. And then I counted up to 10, which is long, <laughs> yeah, the water. Yeah. And then I very carefully went up with the gun, like, like already in the good position, like horizontal. I put yeah. in the gun like this. And not going inside this terrain, but staying into the hole. And then she was really there checking, where is this guy? And then I shot him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. a fun. Others, I could tell you more dramatic things like a top two tune and things like this. But it's like when you do bomb diving or middle water floating, mm. you see things coming and you just adapt and shoot. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. a challenge, of course. Yeah. Yeah. To make it happen that fish comes to you, I think this is the art within spearfishing. Hundred percent, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, sometimes like the big fish, the story's not always as like uh, memorable. Like the experience isn't as memorable. I think the hunt, like what you do in order to get the reward, is a very important part of it. Like, you know, we're not. You know, otherwise you just, hey, oh, look, there's a school of dog tooth tuna. I'm just going to throw a stick of dynamite in there and then hold up 50 of them on the back of a trawler. You know, like it, for us, it's as much about the, the effort that we put in and the, and the strategy and the, you know, the, the battle of wits, I think. It's, it's extremely rewarding. Like it's like it's, um, it's satisfying at, a, at another level. Like it's, it's hard to explain to people. I think... I think this is the parallel, the real hunting side of things, that, that, that passion. Yeah, and also for me, it's, for example, very interesting how I shot the fish. Yeah, I make yeah. one example. I have this snapper that I did not see. I turn my face, and just from the edge of my mask that kills visibility, of course, I see, man, he's over me. How can I shoot a fish that is over me? But I know it's a travelly, a jack, so they are curious as hell. So I just, instead of staying like very still, I thought, okay, I will behave now. And there comes this marine life knowledge that I acquired by years and years checking YouTube video, nature documentary and things like this. Mm. And then I thought, if I behave like a ray, if, because if I stay still, it's like, huh? And then he will go, mm. thinking like, oh, strange. And I started to scratch and did a little bit like this, <laughs> very <laughs> silly. And then he probably, I guess, he was thinking, it's a weird thing, but he does behave like a ray. Let's stay there because maybe some small fish will go out and I can chase it. Yeah, yeah. Huh? So uh -huh. he waited there and he went away and they react a lot to grunting. Ah, okay. I don't know if I have the video, but I grunt and he turns immediately back to see, hey, what's up? Ah. Grunting of jacks is, you know, it's typical travelers or jacks. Mm. They do it, you catch them, you probably know this, and you grab them, they make this sound. So this is like, hey, alarm, what's up? <laughs> and with afraid of it, so you should not grant for half an hour, but grant a couple of times, they will come in, and then I shot them. Yeah, nice. Wow. So a lot of times, jacks, they, they appear from a rock. Yesterday also, a small pargo marillo, he came like in front of me, he was like 10 centimeters from my spare gun. I really, no ex exaggeration. And I thought like, it's impossible for me to react at such a short distance. Distance, I will miss him. So he went like this, and he went away. I grabbed him, he come again, and then he was on the side. And that's what I love. Mm. Headshot. No rock entangling lines. My buddies are waiting for me. He shot again a fish in a cave, and he will stay here for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you respect, respectful towards them as well, you know? 
Yeah. But I love to try to shoot in a way, if it's a headshot, it's cool, okay? But in a way that it's easy to retrieve. Avoids mm -hmm. a lot of problems and it's quick. And if there is predators around like sharks, they will not come in so quickly. You know, if you finish your job cleanly, quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this. Yeah. I take my time in shot, but what would, would be the message? Yeah. What do you think causes people to make poor decisions with shots, with shooting fish, and then they get the fish in a cave or in a difficult situation that takes a long time to retrieve? For new people, of course, it's experience. Yeah? They see the fish, I need to shoot it now. Mm. If they don't know, the fish will stay in the cave and he feels safe there. And you can even leave the gun there, go up, breathe, go down, because the gun, because it's a foreign object, an alien mm. object, they will think like, what the heck is that? In this cave, they feel safer there. They will not exit. Even they could. Mm. It's only a gun. So you can come down the second time. So I guess a lot of people carry shots because of missing uh, experience. And maybe some competition with the friends. Hey, this guy shot already three. I have zero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, I hate losing shafts. Mm. So oh, me too. I hate this. And it's not the money. It's like, oh, come on. I, I didn't bring a spare shaft with me. Oops, wrong. <laughs> I for five days. I have no spare shafts. Can happen. <laughs> <laughs> or I put the nylon, the, the, the dynema or the monofilament, not on the rear hole, like in mm. this Rob Allen. You can put it on the rear hole. That's cool for, for hunting in caves. If you need to put it on a shark fin, if you miss or something, you pull, then this amount of, of uh, back part of the shaft will get entangled somewhere on a rock, on a, yeah. rock, on a So Very if you're cave, you're lying on the very back hole. If you don't have this, buy a shaft for that. Yeah. And buy it short. You don't need big lengths. Mm. Buy good points, must be shorter, and the flopper smaller, because you will be shooting against a rock. Fish is here. So if the full Fair tip plus the flopper, which can be like that. Yeah. Penetrate, but the fish is here, it will not penetrate. You will make a hole in the fish, which looks very circular and nice, but you will lose the fish. Yeah. Flopper cannot engage you. Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuna guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say, Crikey, mate, or say Shrek from the Noob Spear I sent you, and you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check them out. Sometimes with weather and commitments, it's a long time between drinks in your spearfishing journey. If you want a dry training program that can keep you in some kind of shape for spearfishing, check out Ted Hardy's 28-day freediving transformation at noobspearer.com forward slash Ted. That's noobspearer.com forward slash Ted. Now, the 28-day freediving transformation is just a practical dry training plan that Ted Hardy will walk you through and it will help you get results even if you can't get wet at the moment. Check it out at noobspirit.com forward slash TED. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough. Just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiro's know and trust. I know because one works there and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian made hydration products tailored for Spiro's and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. I noticed you're using like a, a, a shorter roller gun. Is that a Chris Coates CDR run roller? Yeah? No, it's not, but I would recommend it because he tunes them and has the right rubber measurements, etc. that are perfect. Mm. Uh, mine is a very standard propellant uh, roller gun. Uh, only thing is the carbon... Tube series. Mm. I do this 
I would recommend this on the shorter guns because the carbon is like how much? I think 80 or 120 grams lighter than the yeah. aluminum uh, um, pipe or tube. And this compensates the heavier muscle. Uh -huh. Why I do this? I hate when I had this before, but I will not say the brand because the guys are nice and make very good guns. But I had a 90 roller. I shot, put the gun away. That's what you should do to handle fish, you know. Not, not keep the gun and handle fish, the fish yeah. at the same time. So I was retrieving this uh, Spanish mackerel. No, actually, it was a red snapper in the UAE. And then I turn around and like, what is there? And it was my gun sinking. Yeah. I said, now I have two tasks to handle. Yeah. I hate it. And I, I emailed uh, a dye factory, uh, Rob Allen in uh, South Africa. And they told me, yes, no, go for the carbon. And then he explained me this. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, okay, I did purchase wrong for my intent. Yeah. So 90 roller carbon. And I use it 90% of my time, even with good visibility. Mm. Because if you know how to approach fish, it's cool. And I like to do this <laughs> Indian style between rocks and things. And yeah, yeah. of course, do other things as well, like this little mackerels here, the Pacific Sierra. But they are not too careful. If you yeah. move and you know how to move, they will even join you. It's very funny. So you select which one is the fastest one and you shoot them. Ah, okay. So uh, for here, 90 roller is good. And I have a 120 roller for good vis and fatter fish because you need more kinetic en energy to for the shaft to penetrate. Yeah. And then very big things. Okay, wood gun, lots of rubbers, but that's a different story. Yeah. Mm. So with your 120 roller, is that still a single roller or yes. double? Okay. All right, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I use a one meter roller for just about everything too. Uh Duncan Henderson from Speargun Engineering built it, but it's a Rob Allen handle, carbon barrel, very similar to what you do. He he puts his own muzzle and his own trigger mechanism in it. But I love that gun. Like one thing with the with the shorter rollers is you have to change the rubber more regularly than you would, I think, with a conventional gun. Do you, would you agree with that? These things, for example, I would be the last person to ask because I'm not <laughs> material scientist. You know what yeah. I did? Really, but that's no, no joking trick. Mm. I write an email to Primeline Industry mm. and they respond to me. Oh, wow. They know yeah. because they manufacture for all brands without naming them. Uh, and they have different, uh, um, I'm not a scientist on this field, so I will just explain it broadly, but they have different formulas. Mm. So the molecules, etc., are designed in such a way that, for example, if you have Low water guns, they are loaded for long periods of time until you shoot them. Yeah. So this this band, okay, it's stretched all the time. So it's a little bit different formula. Yeah. And then there is one that when it's under a deep water, the water, because of the gun elongation, it's somewhere permeable. The yep. water will filter in. Yeah. And this will change the way how it compresses the rubber. Yeah. Mm. Uh, not compressive, actually. It goes back to its original size. Yeah. There's water, but it can stop. So it's very scientific. I drop an email to these guys. They always respond. They're really yeah, nice right. guys. Yeah, yeah, I think with, with my roller, I have to make sure, and I don't do it all the time, I don't take the pretension off. And so if you leave a gun under pretension for, you know, let's just say for 12 hours, like it's going to lose elasticity eventually, you know. Like so for me, it's just like not being onto it with – taking the tension off. I think that's, you have to do it with rollers. I always, when I'm not using them, I disengage them from the pretension. So yeah. they're loose. Yeah. yeah. yeah and okay. even, the thing is like, I'm very selective, so my gun will be loaded for maybe two hours, sometimes three hours, even yeah. if I'm going to the boat. If I remember, and I'm not too lazy, <laughs> I will disengage them so they can rest a little bit. But I yeah. don't, I don't know if this really is good or better. I don't know. Okay, interesting. I, yeah. I um, one thing with that smaller roller with the carbon barrel of yours, that they, they're quite quiet, quite maneuverable. Um, when you work in and around cave country, which you seem to like to do, how do you stop yourself from making noise, like without being intentional about it, like accidental noise? I'm talking about when I hunt in caves. You mean? Mm. Actually, I, I'm not doing this on purpose that I'm very stealthy. Okay, when there is very murky water, fish is very 
very uh, like scared for anything. Yeah. When there is clear water and there is a sound, they can hear it. They hear better than us anyway. So they can locate it. You know? And they will think like, okay, somewhere there, the vis is good. So let's have a look and they are more relaxed. Once it's murky, they will react much more on sound. So kicking with your fins against a rock is not a good idea. I use a lot my left hand because I'm right-handed, so that's my gun hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Watch, I put it on the right hand because on the left, I'm cling clunk. I also damage the watch besides making sounds. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a and good idea. Time like this, but usually I don't look underwater. I look on surface time, things like this. So now I lost my watch. Silly thing. <laughs> but uh, I usually don't have it on the left. So my left side is my propulsion side, the arm. Mm -hmm. And I don't use the legs also because they are bigger masses and they consume more oxygen than my little biceps and triceps. Mm. Yeah. So that's one way to do it. But the most important thing probably, if you don't want to make too much noise, is buoyancy management. You have to regulate your weight because if you have too much weight, you will drag around the, the rocks, you know. Mm. If you have a neutral, slightly sinking one for that depth, then it's more, much more easy for you as a diver to stay horizontal. Mm. And then you can play, I don't do this always, but you can play with the neck weight. Mm. Because the diver, having all the weight in the middle, I exaggerate it now, it will mm. bend you through like a banana. Yeah. Mm. So in Spain, for very shallow places, I had ankle weights. That is quite typical in, in Mediterranean. Mm. To hold down the fins. Why? Because in cold winter waters, you have a very thick weight, so 5 mm, 7 mm. sometimes. And that's a lot of neoprene. Your fins will be like saying hello to the fish, so you put some weight there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you have weight, neck, but this is more for advanced, because in a case of emergency, you need to release that and that, you know? Yeah. But you put on the neck a kilo, one and a half, not too much. And then the rest on the belly, then you are basically... Balancing horizontally your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, and it's more like towards this. And also, when you do the free dive, the duck dives, the descent, if you have a neck weight only, ideal case for free divers, then the weight will auto align you into the vertical direction. Mm. Right? All these things I did in the book as well. You know? It's a lot of tips and tricks that are That's not great. for me. This guy said this, I'm like, oh, I never thought about this. Great Boy, information. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dive knife positioning. I did notice that you like to carry a knife on the inside of your left leg. Do you carry one or two knives? I carry only one. I know I should carry two because if one, la, 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 you know, this safety thing, and it's absolutely... Um, yeah, now it's difficult because we teach some things <laughs> and we teach the best place for a knife is to put it on the belt. And it's true. Yeah? But depends which knife. And now comes the dilemma with my person. Yeah? Yeah. I like a long knife, which is not necessary for killing a fish. Yeah, yeah. To so a normal small knife, it's better, you know, less bulky thing, la, la, la. But I have a longer one because I cut fish, I clean fish, I cut ropes, I clean uh, ghost nets and things like this. And with a small one, I'm... I work double time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the only reason. And it's actually bad because I learned by mistake, I catch a amberjack by the gills, put the knife inside, and I went through a soft spot and injured my other hand. Yeah, <laughs> I've, done, I've done the same. Yeah. <laughs> I did it through a groper too, and then um, it actually uh, come through on my, you know, my, my not my, what, the, what do they call that finger? You know, the one you give people the finger with. You know what I'm saying, finger. you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the middle finger, yeah. Um, I stabbed through and into like the knuckle joint and it was through a groper's head. You know, sometimes you can't hit the spot and it went through into my finger and I ended up with some weird growth. I don't know if it was from the groper DNA in my, like in the wound and the bone joint, I don't know. But I, I think most, many Spiros have stabbed through the head of a fish when they're braining it and then into their own hand. So this is common, yeah. I think. The knife thing, just to add to what I was saying, is I have it yes, on sir. the leg, but not outside. Outside, it, it's silly. I have it inside, and if you saw the blade design, it's like a very flat handle, mm. and you can only open it pushing left and right, so it will never fall off. So if I hit a rock, it's one side only, it will stay. I never lost a knife of this uh, uh, brand 
for design. And I have it inside, so nothing can entangle, even lines. Mm. Nothing. When I wore it on the belt, it happened to me that I got entangled. A friend is helping me, but he did not do what he should do. So the line was still with me. And I was looking, and suddenly I see the line around my 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 knife. Mm. And that's what I did not like. So I removed all from my belt. And the only thing besides weights I have on my belt is a little deer ring. Yeah. But not one that goes down and opens because that could entangle again. No, I have one that is flat and makes this. So any yeah. line will go over it. And I just use it to cl- clip in my boy when I'm going from A to B. Ah, uh, okay. And I unlock it with a small weight weighted clip. And I leave it on a place and I roam around this boy for hunting, you know. Ah, okay. And then somewhere else, I clip it back again. Or if I need to help somebody, I will clip my gun, but only the long one. So the shaft is not on my feet, but further away because it's not safe to have a loaded gun there. Yeah. And to clip, I don't know, a flasher, things like this. But that's the only thing I have on my belt. Wow. So it's very important for me and my students also. I have an American friend, very nice guy. And he told me, no, he would like the knife there and this, this, this. Say, no, it's okay. That's how we teach even. Mm. But then we caught a, a bigger fish and he was entangled exactly there. And I told him, you see, there's not a perfect place because you need a knife somewhere. Mm. Some people sit on their arm. I personally don't like it because that's my working area with all the lines. Mm. So I don't like it, even if it's knife accessibly, absolutely. But mm, no, but it's a lot of times it's, what is the knife for? Well, it's a safety tool. It's not a killing Rambo thing. You know, it's a safety tool, first of all. So you should have it somewhere where you can access it easily. And that's why the idea of the two knives, it's not wrong at all. Yeah. Some people like the weight vests, and then you can kind of have the knife up on your chest, you know, uh, on the on the vest. Like um, my friend Bert, Old Man Blue, makes a really nice weight vest here in Australia. I think that, that would be a nice place to have it. But... I, at the moment, I've got so used to diving with a weight belt that I still dive with a weight belt most of the time, and I, I will wear it in the waist. The other problem of wearing it in the waist is, yes, one entanglement. The other one I have is sometimes if the knife is slightly positioned wrong on your weight belt, when you duck dive and you do awkward movements, the knife can sort of dig into you and you have to adjust things and stuff like this. So, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, cool. Thank you. One thing, Robert, and, and I think maybe you, you will understand this, and 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 this idea, it's not something I would talk about with everyone. But one thing I think about with Spiro's doing trips overseas is how to understand them. And this is my my broad idea at the moment is there's kind of these three three broad ranges of skills that 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 people have to have. I think one is like free diving level, like your capability in terms of depth and. Uh, adaptation and all of those sorts of things and, and your, also your experience. One is spearfishing, which is specifically hunting and fish sense. And then the third one and possibly the most important is like it comes under your attitude and ethics. So how you treat your buddy, how you talk to people, um, whether you're just a killer and want to shoot everything and fill up every esky there is on the boat or whether you're like the opposite end of the scale, which is like you're not even sure that you want to go spearfishing, you're still, you know, a member of Sea Shepherd and so on. Um, I, I think of these as these three sort of broad ranges of things that I have to understand about a customer so that I can um, make sure that I am putting them with the right people and providing them with the right experience. How do you think about this, though? Yeah, it's very accurate. I do something very similar. That's why the reason I love to do Zoom calls, because a friend told me, but then you have to talk with a lot of people that maybe even will not embark on the journey. Mm. Say, yes, but it's like their choice. It's not me telling them to go. You know, it's, I'm just offering something. Mm. And in the meeting, I get to know them. Of course, I present Panama and what we do, so they get an idea, and they don't come here with false expectations and people pick websites and nice pictures, and then it's like <laughs> murky water, horrible, no fish, which is not the case here. Yeah. But in this call, I try to find out, yes, what's their experience, who they will come with. For example, some are pure spearfishing uh, trips. So mm. only four or eight guys, only spearfishing. And then we go on a sailboat and we go to Las Perlas for seven days. Mm. The other is like, no, all the spearfishing guys that are not uh, bachelors or, or, or singles, and they have families. So they mix 
they're fishing with family, even mama, papa coming. So we put mm. them some nice oil on the beach and some chairs. And then I tell them, well, you can do both here. Because if we go with a sail ship, it's for eight people. So four guys with their girlfriends, wives, fiancé, whatever, or mama, papa, as they want. And they can come here. And I ask this. Yeah? Mm. And what do you expect? Do you want to do only spear fishing? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you want to do some special kind of fish? You have any ideas? You know about Panama already? Mm. And then I can explain, or they know. Mm. And then we'll, I, I will custom make all these uh, trips for them. So a typical question is, uh, people that are like in a hurry is like, okay, what do we do and how much? And I say, I don't know. I don't know you. How long What's is your business trip? Yeah. <laughs> American guys, they have little vacations compared to Europeans, for example. So in the UK, the guys, I think they have 30 days vacations. It's a lot. America is different, 10 days, 15, depending how long you are with the company, seniority, etc. Mm. So for them, it's very typical to book seven days. And out of the seven, the last one and the first one are arrival departure day. Mm. And then we go together, visit some monkeys in the Panama Canal, have fun or fish in the rivers, whatever they want to do, I do it. And then the other five days are, okay, that's the spare fishing time. Mm. Was, would ask them more about what they want. And of course, skills, because I'm a very safe diver. I never had a blackout or something. At least I don't remember. <laughs> Little joke. Uh, but <laughs> I don't want to have applications. Yeah? Yeah. I ask them, are you used to dive in a body team? Yes, cool. Would you come in this, with this journey, into this journey with your body? Yeah, mm. so I know who are a team. They know yeah. each other. They have signs maybe in place to second shot, help me retrieve. I don't have air. Yeah, but what you said, yeah, it's roughly what we do here. Yes. Okay. All right, yes. cool. Well, let's chat about spearfishing then in Panama. So um, as I mentioned before, we're going to book a Zoom call. It's going to be on Wednesday the 13th of March, Brisbane time, 8 p.m., Panama time, 5 a.m., if you go to noobspiro.com forward slash Panama, I'll try and have your date and time there in different parts of the world so you get a rough idea. But what we're going to do on this Zoom call is uh, Robert will present Panama. He has a really amazing slide deck that explains it as a destination. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. But right now on this podcast, Rob, I want to, I want to get into um, some of the broad ideas around spearfishing in Panama. So you know, species, uh, let's get into it. Okay. Uh, species, we got a lot of different species. Allow me to start why we have so much species, maybe. Yeah? Perfect. I mean, you've seen the, the, the slide deck, so you know what I'm going through. Mm. Uh, we have this, I call it the fishy triangle, meaning it in a good way. So there is like uh, Cocos Islands and this ridge that comes down from Central America up to Galapagos. Galapagos from Panama is roughly 1,200 kilometers. Then it goes in a straight line, more or less straight line, to, uh, to Ecuador because this sort of place belongs to Ecuador. All mm. these are protected areas. And then Gorgona belongs to, Costa Rica, to Colombia. These are like three, four five UNESCO areas we have in the regions, and all this into a triangle that is then inside like a basin. Yeah. So we have depth of 4,000 meters in Colombia just before the border of Panama, actually into the border of Panama, then 3,000 meters, then 1,000, and then you have a shelf, boom. Yeah. And there is this plateau where all these 200 islands of La Perla's lie, and where we love to go spear fishing, and that concentrates a lot of marine uh, biodiversity and mass there. Yeah. The mass is on the Pacific much more than on the Caribbean because mm. like three years ago, Panama did not exist. So South and North America were not connected and the currents were distributing nutrients, salinity was similar, stuff like that. And when the Panama Isthmus emerged and closed this gap, mm. then suddenly Pacific and Caribbean were isolated. Wow. So on the Pacific, we have a lot of nutrients and this very deep place provide a lot of upstream of nutrients and it's yeah. cold, they're really cold. So we use, I <laughs> use even five millimeter wetsuit sometimes. Wow. Yeah, but this only in two months, maybe one and a half, two months, it's very cold, yeah. Mm. During the rest of the year, we have 28, 29 degrees. So I use a rush guard most of the year, actually. 
But now, January, February, into March, it's like when it cools down. We like okay. this. Yeah? This cold comes up, not because the streams change, it's because the trade winds suddenly start to blow very quick and strong in this season. That's what the pirates know. That's how they navigate it around the globe. Yeah. So the stream pushes offshore all the surface water, and then it pushes, pulls up all the cold water. Cold water. So it's like up mm. Yeah. And that's why yesterday even we felt some quite cold water after 10 meter or 50 meter. Wow. And the other cool thing, what's bear fishing like in Panama is, as we have a lot of these shallow places, mm. you see there is the plateau of 100 meter. It's not even 100, it's 90, 80, 70. And then you have all these pinnacles and islands coming out of the oceans. Mm. There are hundreds of them. We have 1,500 islands here wow. in Panama, many. So on the Pacific side, between the islands, okay, there is a peak, there is a peak, there is a peak. There is not too much depth. Yeah. So the fun thing is you can catch a lot of big fish even in very shallow water. Wow. Three weeks ago, I caught a snapper, a cubera one, in five meters of water. You can imagine? Sounds great. They grow so huge fish, too. Then. Yeah, they grow even far more than that. They can get like... KG, I don't remember, but 50 plus, they get wow. monster. Yeah. Um, so people ask me, is it good for beginners? Say, it's for everybody. Beginner, enjoy the shallow dives. They can catch fish in shallows and mm. big fish will come in. So we have these huge Pacific Goliath groupers. It's allowed to shoot them here. We have no restrictions. Yep. They are everywhere here, so it's not a, a problem. Uh, we shoot the smaller ones, like 30 to 40 kgs, <laughs> <laughs> because they grow massive. But the big ones we don't shoot because we believe they, are, they have like these alpha genes. They should be forwarded to next generation. So yeah. I don't shoot them. We don't shoot them. And um, other fish that you can catch, it's like uh, uh, these almaco jacks. Mm. They come even into very shallow water. I had a 40 kg one, my estimation. Cruising under me after I dove and I was uh, having the hook breath. And then after I saw him, I was like, ah, bad timing. Yeah. And this guy was like, yeah, so it was maybe three meters. Wow. Like a 35 kilo fish. Uh, that it was a rooster fish. Las Perlas also in nine meters of depth. Mm. Yeah. So for beginners, it's wow. But then the experience say, ah, but then it's not for me. Say, no, it's for you. Because instead of descending for one minute, staying half minute, and then going up for one minute, if your dive time is 2.30, you're going down 10 minutes, spend the whole two and two minutes roughly just relaxing, On the perfecting your skills of attracting fish, because that's a big skill for being a good hunter, observing how they behave, a lot of time for small ones to approach you, small more eels would love to come to investigate as well. Mm -hmm. just away and so for experienced divers it's like you get big fish you learn how to handle big fish because not every experienced guy had the chance like in the mat mm. a lot of people don't have the chance to get fish heavy fish you know so it's difficult to handle them so they can learn a lot here as well and it's a lot of fun yeah yeah i like i really like your powerpoint presentation because you know you draw from you know the you know, the topography, you use Navionics maps to show people some of the amazing ground that you cover and um, you sort of show your really well explored parts, the bits that you have spent a long time at. And then you also point out the areas that you would like to explore that you might do with some more adventurous crowd. I think one thing I really liked about it is, uh, you know, it's uh, smaller groups and very specific to what, what people really want to do. And uh, I, think, I think that's an appeal all of its own. Yes. Now we try, I mean, you, you, you cited me on the inhale nature, smile a lot thing that I write on my Instagram. And I wrote this I, how many years ago. I never changed it. <laughs> I'm officially like uh, in pension. So all what I do, and I always did this my whole life, is to have fun, to be surrounded by good people. And that's what it's about here. It's not like... If you did not catch a big fish or a loser, no, 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 no. We enjoyed a lot. We learned a lot. We show you these monster groupers. We swim with them. You see the, I don't know, the, the, the shark whales and things like that. 
We see the turtles on the beach nesting, you know. We have a lot of fun. Does not mean everything happens in half a day, but you can do all these things, you know. Yeah, love it. Love it. That's excellent. Hey, buddy. How's your breath hold going? Really? You struggling? I do too sometimes. And that's why I've got something perfect for you today. I think you'll agree with me when I say that maintaining or even increasing your breath hold is a struggle, especially when you're not slaying fish every week. But what if I told you there was a way to train yourself easily and do it safely? Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold understand your body better and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program, Freediving for Spearfishers, is not for noobs. Uh, It's for people who have some diving under their belts and understand basic spearfishing safety. But it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. The goal is a five minute static. And check it out, Freediving for Spearfishers at howtofreedive.com. You can get started for free, do the taster, and if you do decide to purchase, use the code NOOBSPEARO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O, to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Imagine on your last spearfishing trip, your best mate never comes up from his last dive and dies from a blackout. Picture having to tell their family, spouse, and kids that their loved one died on your watch and knowing their death could have been prevented simply by being near them when they surfaced. Unfortunately, I've had many people reach out to me over the years and share exactly what that was like. I can't imagine anything worse than this. If you want to make sure this doesn't happen to you, simply commit to diving safer. My name is Ted Hardy, and I'm the founder of Immersion Freediving, and I want to do more to stop the needless fatalities from blackout than any other person on the planet. And that's why I created freedivingsafety.com. If you want to learn how to reduce your risk of having a blackout, how to save your buddy's life, sign up for my free course at freedivingsafety.com. It is not a substitute for an in-person course, but it's free, comes from a trusted and reliable source, and you can start learning immediately. One month after launching this course, a spear called me and said he saved his buddy's life just from going through the course. His buddy blacked out underwater. He was able to recognize the signs immediately and was able to save his life. Jeremy Gamble, founder of Spearing Magazine, said since he started hunting in cooperative teams, they put way more fish in the cooler than they ever did competing against each other. Dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, especially when you can learn for free at freedivingsafety.com. Okay, so people can sort of come. What about times of year? So you said you mentioned these sort of two or three months that where you get this cold or upwelling, but it can be quite fishy as I understand it. Um, I think you can spearfish there all year round, but um, give us a little bit of an understanding of how, how the calendar year works there. The calendar year is something very, very, let's say, up to everybody to choose what he feels comfortable or not. I explain now. Um, I like to dive without too many weights, means no wetsuits. And we fish year-round, as you said, and it's correct. There is always fish here. When the winter comes, we call it summer here because it does not rain, but it's the northern hemisphere, so it's winter. When the winter comes, the water gets colder. Okay, this brings a lot of fish up, Mm. but it brings also nutrients. Up means it might be a little bit murky. Mm. Yeah? And you don't have rain, things like this. I personally... Did not understand Panamanians the first year I was here when they told me, no, we prefer when it's rainy season. And I was like, what the heck? It's nicer in summer. The sun is shining. No, no, no. Because then the water of the sea is nicer, it's warmer, it's rainy season. So the year I would divide like photos. One Q or quarter one, like January, February, March, it's where it's supposed to be cold unless the phenomenon of Nino is disturbing us a little bit and shifting things. And that's where very big fish, even, you know, these groupers, you saw a video, I think, that I showed you. They are like at three meters, five meters. And okay, the, the deep ones are at 10, 15 meters. Uh, this is the, like the dry season. It's nice for Instagram photos, the palms in the back, and it's sunny and the nice white clouds, and it's beautiful. In August, September, September October, it's more rainy. Very rainy even, but it's not like it will rain for the whole day. Mm. It will rain, typical tropical rains, a lot, maybe half an hour. Mm. 
The skies might stay gray, yes, which is not so nice for pictures, of course. But for fishing, it's quite nice because when there is a lot of clouds, it gets dark. My feeling is all the snapper roam around earlier, not waiting until the dusk and dawn and things like this. You know, I see them more outside, but that's my perception. Mm. So the summary would be we fish year round. Mm. Now, if you are specific for, I don't know, some special fish, there is a little bit of peaks maybe, depending on the fish species. But this is probably more affecting pelagics mm. that have migratory paths. But as I said, we have 4,000, 3,000, 1,000 and the bay. So our fish stock is here the whole year, honestly. You can have my The pargos are fish that are not migrating thousands of miles. They simply don't do this. So the almaco jacks are very lazy guys. They stay around here the whole year, actually. Yeah, there are better times, and, you know, depends on the currents and their bait fish. But a lot of the fish we hunt, it's very close to a habitat. They will move around, but not 1,000 miles. Impossible. This is only migra migratory species. And most of them stay here anyway. <laughs> so you also have a few different locations and modalities for running these trips. Some of them you like to run off a sailboat. And uh, I've been spearfishing off sailboats and off the tenders that you tie to them. I really love this experience. I, I think it's... Um, it's very unique and very cool, and I think it's very attached to what we what we like to do, you know. Which is, and I love traveling quietly too. So, um, and but then you have another operation too, where um, it's close to the shore. You launch a powerboat uh, in a river, and then you head out and it's amazing spearfishing. Can you walk? Tell me through talk talk through some of these different situations. Yes. Um, when potential guests ask me ask me what kind of trips we do. I sort it by accommodation. Okay. I don't say it's proper, but I do it like this. Because okay. then the rest of, the, of the, the, the trip can be designed nicely to accommodate their expectations. Um, for me, the sailboat is the best experience at all. Mm. Because you're on a sailboat, you never lose contact to the spare fishing ground. You move from one place to another. Should there be a place that is a little bit too windy for some people, then, okay, we take the sailboat, go around the island or the islands. We look for another place. Mm. I think I showed you the topography. So we are some places that are having mountain ranges that are very protected from winds. Yeah. So we just do the other one. With the sailboat, it's like your floating hotel. Mm. <laughs> you take it with you wherever you want to go. And even you can be spontaneous and say, we go to the southmost island, which is closer to Colombia. There is a lot of currents, but I talked about it. It's exploration kind of day, and we're, let's go crazy, and we can do this. And besides this, if you think in terms of money, well, if you are onshore, you need to pay for accommodation anyway. Mm. These guys on the sailboat, you don't care because they will give you food, snacks, everything is included. Mm. Everything. So it's a very convenient way to... Be lazy when you are finished the have finished the spearfishing day. You don't need to go out for dinner and, or cook yourself. Oh, mamma mia! Who will cook? Who will do the dishes? No, I want to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> Next, I just want to be lazy in a hammock. So, and the sailboat gives you also this experience from Panama City to the place, which is mm -hmm. five hours, six hours, depending if we stop and we do some funny things. And uh, on the way there, we will catch very probably some mahi, see some dolphins. The mahi goes straight into the kitchen. We make ceviche. And so we can enjoy the fruits of the sea that day. Mm. And with the steamboat, as I said, it's very nice to be close to the place. And as you're advancing, we drop with one of the boats. And uh, depending how many people, it can be a dinghy, but I don't like dinghies. They're like wobbly and small things. We have real pagas with outboard motor. So we have one of these. We drop so the sailboat continues. We stay at this place and we just spare fish around and then don't have to go back to meet the boat. No, why? We already anchored at our destination. So it's very efficient, spare fishing in terms of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it would be like the sailboat thing and I can talk about this for two hours. It's very nice. Uh, because you talk a lot about sailing as well and, you know, it's more than spare fishing. If guys are starting to get intrigued, again, you're going to go to noobspero.com forward slash Panama 
and uh, register there to jump on with our live Zoom call because we're pretty much going to show – Robert's going to present uh, – do a full presentation of Panama as a destination. Cool. Let's let's go back. So that's one side of it is the sailboat and having a look. And again, guys, go to noobspirit.com forward slash Panama. There's a, you've, you've got a full presentation of what that looks like, what the sailboats are like and that whole experience. Talk to me about, if you can about the other – Part of it, which is where you really rent, like they're almost like a you call it a casa or what? What is it? You mean the bungalow version? Yeah, the bungalow version. Yeah, no, I love that one as well. The only difference is the lack of this experience of sail fishing, and what else? The departure and arrival point of the daily trips, it's the same, which is the river mouth where we go into the sea to launch the boat. But for the rest, it's an amazing place. It's very close to islands and also to a rich, not a rich, sorry, the end of Panama's uh, peninsula that mm -hmm. touches a uh, step down to 500, nearly 1,000 meters on some points. Wow. So you always have fish there, a nice fish. So that location would be very nice, like reef structures. And as it's mainland, it can have some drop-offs that are uh, more deep. Then the islands that are like a pinnacle, but flat in between them. Yeah. With the exception of the outer islands that go deeper, of course. But it's like a plateau having a lot of pinnacles in Las Perlas. And here is like mainland dropping into the, the sea. Wow. So you have more depths. Um, you have similar species, but you can add also there big chances of wahoo. Mm. And these guys, because these drops... They come in very close. So it happened to us that we see them like 50 meters from the shore. Wow. What? And we throw the flasher, they come and look at it, you know, things like this. So you can encounter them. Mm. Even yellowfin tuna might pass around. In terms of fishing, it's similar, but it has more of this structure. It's a little bit more wild. And so, um, so you're, you're heading out in the morning in a panga? And then you're coming yep. back mid-afternoon, I'm guessing, or in the evening, and then you stay in these bungalows that like seems like very like almost like uh, Western level, very nice yep. Western level, you know, um, modern accommodation, hot showers, the works. Yes, I checked a couple of those accommodations, and this one was uh, um, uh, suggested to me by a friend. Actually, he invited us to the to the place, and that's when I first saw it. And um, it's a surfer guy who started putting up bungalows. And what he did, and that's why I like it so much, is the normal lodges, because we're in the jungle, it's very humid here. When you use wood and a lot of these things, it's nice, but you need to know how to build properly. Otherwise, they rot. Yeah. And the ceiling inside with styrofoam, and I don't know what people use nowadays to isolate from the heat. It gets a lot of, uh, what we call it, mold. Yeah. Smelly, and it looks not very uh, clean, you know. And his bungalows are like made of very sophisticated materials. So they okay. were expensive to, to build against the local simple construction type. Yep. And the air condition, he's got even new fiber optics there. So for the Wi-Fi fans and internet <laughs> fans, ah, wow. they can stay after spear fishing there and communicate to the family, etc. And he built a nice rancho. Rancho is a, a roofed area that is open. And he put there, I think he even put a billiard pool now. And he's got some barbecue area. We can wash dishes there if we want to have a little party or just have a nice dinner together there and cook some things ourselves. We can do it there. Or we can do it in the bungalows. This is a full kitchen, microwave, a big fridge inside, you know, living area. There is uh, two bedrooms, uh, sorry, one bedroom with two beds or how we call it, bunk beds. So we can put up to four people there. Uh, these are three bungalows, so we can have 12 people there. Wow. And that's amazing. Mostly used by people probably that will not go spearfishing there, but mama, papa is coming and checking. And on the mainland, you can stroll around the, the beach for those that are not spearfishing. Or you join the old papa and mama that think they cannot do anything on the sea. No, no, no. It's very easy to board them on the river because it's quiet. Then nice. we go out to the and they can fish with hand lines, rods, whatever they want, and experience something nice there. Ah, so so cool. it's different, but I like the area a lot. It's the end of a road. To the south is a national park. Mm. And after this national park, there is no connection to the other side of the peninsula. Mm. 
It's very pretty, natural. All the hectares or acres around this place belong to the owner. So it's very tranquil. There is green. There is a river. There is some, what do you call it, a waterfall is there. I'm not joking. It's really like a little Jurassic Park. Ah. It's really amazing. You know? Robert, I'm, I'm already frothing. I watched uh, your presentation once and I you know, immediately added Panama to one of my top three spearfishing destinations. I really want to come over there and do it. We're going to learn more, guys. Go to noobspirit.com forward slash Panama. Register for the Zoom call. Again, uh, depending on where you are in the world, it will uh, either be uh, very early in the morning on the 12th of March or it will be Wednesday evening in Brisbane and in the rest of Australia and New Zealand. So go to noobspirit.com forward slash Panama and register for that. Uh, Robert, really conscious of time. I've had a mad chat with you, but we are definitely running out of time. Um, I've had an absolute ball. I'm looking forward to jumping on and doing the Zoom call with you and and uh, seeing if we can get a bunch of frothers there for that uh, to just investigate and find out a little bit more about Panama. I think one thing you get from your your slide deck is an understanding of the area as a whole. So even if guys are like, hey, I don't have really the budget for anything like that, I think if you want a DIY trip to Panama, uh, I think you could still benefit from watching your presentation. So um, yeah, come and check it out at, uh, again, noobspirit.com forward slash Panama. I think I've said it seven times now, Robert. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, mate, la- last sort of question. Um, actually, I'm going to give you two more. Um, what is the f- one of the funniest experiences you've had out spearfishing? Oh, funniest. Uh, well, as I use a roller gun, when I was exciting to go back in the water, I just delivered one catch, went back in the water, and I forgot to load the gun. And as they are parallel to the tube, I did not see it. A standard gun, you see the, the, the rubbers flopping around. And I was in front of this nice cubera, and I'm pulling the trigger. It's like, eh? What is my shaft doing? It was like sideways out. <laughs> it was oh, like, oh, yeah. So that's a very silly one, yes. I think you've just t- touched on a, a hurt pain point for many of us, so I can relate to that completely. Um, Robert, people can come and find you, Deep Blue Spirit 2 on Instagram, Deep Blue Spirit 2. You've got a YouTube channel as well. If people are interested in having a look at, there's not just Panama spearfishing on there. You've got stuff on there from UAE and all sorts of different spearfishing adventures, so go and check them out. Um, absolute pleasure chatting with you. Um, what could, could you, for you, Robert, You've been spearfishing a long time. Could you explain what the spearfishing experience means to you in like one or two sentences? Um, to me, it's far more than getting a fish. I explained a little bit before in some of the questions. Um, I love nature, first of all. Since small, I was looking TV and all these shows about documentaries and how to catch animals for zoos and things like that. I love uh, marine life. I like underwater. It's so silent. You have this 3D moving around. Uh, I enjoy people a lot. I'm a very funny guy, and I like to enjoy time with people. And I even bring the grumpy people to smile once or uh, <laughs> twice a day. <laughs> and uh, I like to learn about this environment. And if I can catch some yummy, yummy dinner, of course I will do. Uh, that would be probably spearfishing for me. It's it's a uh, Lifestyle, if you say this, sounds a little bit weird, but actually it is because you see, I'm instructor, I did the books and not from one day to another. I started in 95, so it's like a kind of a live project and now finally I publish them. Yeah. So that's pushing for me, yes. And I've introduced you to my book formatter because I, I have a few up on Amazon as well. So hopefully you can get them print on demand without too much hassle and that would be awesome because uh, the the – Illustrated versions are awesome online these days, but sometimes it's nice to have that print book as well on your shelf. So that's cool. Robert, I've had a, I've had a blast chatting with you, man. If people want to check out um, anything we've chatted about today, it'll be at noobspero.com forward slash Robert, uh, including his books on Amazon, which is the Spearfishing Guidebook 1 and 2. And um, we're going to catch up on the Zoom call. Again, it's on uh, the 13th of March or the 12th of March, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, all the details will be up there at noobspero.com forward slash Panama. If you come to one or the other, you'll find everything we've chatted about today. So, Robert, mate, absolute pleasure chatting with you. We have definitely run out of time, so I'm, I reckon we could have chatted for another hour. So I'm sorry I'm pulling it up. No problem. Thank you so much for having me, Shrek. It was really a pleasure talking to you. All good. 
Jeepers, Robert Shaw fires on eight cylinders. Had an absolute blast chatting with him. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And if you are as equally as intrigued as I am about Panama as a spearfishing destination, I hope you are going to come and join us on a Zoom call. Um, if you go to noobspero.com forward slash Panama, uh, you'll find all the details there as well as a Google form uh, so that I can find out who you are and get you in there basically. If you can't make the live Zoom call, uh, if you simply register there, I can send you out the recording after as well. Again, that's at noobspero.com forward slash Panama. But I hope you enjoyed Robert Schmaus. Robert Schmaus. Just, I can't say it any other way. It'd be awkward in real life. Looking forward to meeting the man in person. But um, yeah, get on to it, noobspero.com forward slash Panama. Uh, as usual, massive thanks to you guys, the legends putting fuel in the Noob Sparrow podcast outboard over at patreon.com forward slash Noob Sparrow. There's more than 40 patrons doing that on an episode by episode basis. Can't thank you guys enough. Uh, every week, I am filled with gratitude in you just because it keeps the wheels turning here at the Noob Sparrow podcast HQ. Thanks, guys. I hope you come back next week. I've got a father daughter combo. It's Emma and Marcus Lincoln Smith. Um, Emma is. Uh, an ex, well, she's retired now. She was an Olympian, a winter Olympian in skeleton racing, which I, I can't believe. I couldn't really believe what it was until I had a bit of a chat with her. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy hearing about that. And Marcus, her father, is uh, a really well-regarded marine biologist. Both of them are absolute frothing Spiros. So you're going to enjoy that. Come back in a week, two weeks, and uh, we're going to hear about Ocean Rangers Apparel as well, which is Emma's project. I love to hear about people doing stuff in our sparing world. So, all right, see you guys in two weeks. Cheers, legends. I used to get told there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. But I found out that there are actually three. Score a free hat of your choice when you use the code NoobSparo with every purchase of over $100 at noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman. Get some gear that's nearly guaranteed to drive away the wokesters, but gain admiration from the fishing fraternity. Go to noobspiro.com forward slash taxman and use the code at noobspiro when you spend $100 or more to get yourself a free hat. Again, noobspiro.com forward slash taxman. <laughs> Adreno stocks equipment for noobers. The gear you need for all things freediving and spearfishing. The Adreno spearfishing team froth on helping customers learn about the latest in spearfishing equipment, local diving, upcoming trips and events for Spiros of all levels of experience. There's no ego in there. You're going to meet cool people that love the spearing lifestyle as much as you do. Visit them in store in one of their huge mega stores around Australia. Chat to one of their friendly team members. Take advantage of the Noob Spiro discount code. Save $20 on every purchase over $200 in store, online, easy savings. Pump in the code Noob Spiro if you're shopping online or in store, mention it's one of their friendly team members and save 20 bucks over 200. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro in store. Shop with Adreno, our partner for more than 200 episodes. Buying gear online can be tricky. You ask yourself the same questions. Will it arrive on time? Is it actually what I want? How much is the shipping going to cost? Great news, the name you can trust is Neptonics. Neptonics, solid gear that works. Visit Neptonics, buy tough gear. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. That's right, use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at neptonics.com. <laughs>